22 million rand that belongs to Digital Vibes, the communications company at the center of a massive corruption scandal involving associates of Health Minister Dr. Zulim Kize, has been frozen by the Special Investigating Unit. Now, the SIU was granted the preservation order by the Special Tribunal after it presented evidence it has gathered thus far in its investigation into unlawful and irregular dealings between Digital Vibes and the Department of Health, amounting to 150 rand. Now, the latest developments come after the Minister of Health, Dr. Zulim Kiza, was put on special leave by President Cyril Ramaphosa for his alleged links to the company. To talk to me about the significance of law enforcement agencies freezing assets linked to alleged criminal activities, we are now joined by Willi Hofmeyer, the former head of a special investigating unit and asset for feature unit at the National Prosecuting Authority. Mr. Hofmeyer, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Morning Live. Uh, good morning and thanks for having me. Now, would you be in a position to give us a more detailed and a clearer picture with regards to the processes that law enforcement agencies <clears throat> follow uh, in terms of curbing corruption and relating to the freezing of assets and bank accounts of alleged companies and individuals you know, that have been linked to impropriety? Uh, indeed, yeah. There is a, <clears throat> there's a number of ways in which law enforcement can recover the money. Um, I'll start with a special investigating unit because uh, they did this matter. Um, essentially, the SIU, as it's called for short, has the power to recover money that has been stolen by government. Its mandate is a little bit limited because it depends on the president giving it the proclamation to do a specific case. So that's not a problem at the moment when we have a good president, but unfortunately when we have a bad president, as we have had in the past, mm. um, it can mean that very little is done. But essentially what the SIU does, it brings a normal civil court case in front of a special tribunal that has been set up for it, and it sues the people who received the money and it gets a tribunal, which is a form of a court, to order that the money must be repaid to the state. So that's one way of, of recovering money. The asset forfeiture unit in the National Prosecuting Authority has much wider powers than that. So it has the power to essentially recover assets in two ways. The one depends on a criminal case. So if somebody is charged in a criminal case, the asset forfeiture unit can freeze their assets up to the total amount of the offenses with which they are charged. Um, but it also has wider powers. It can recover monies from people you know, many criminals are not that rich because they make sure that their children or their trusts uh, have the money. Mm. So the asset forfeiture unit does have better powers to deal with relatives and, and others. Um, and it can do that in two ways. The one power is not dissimilar to the SIU powers. So basically, if somebody has stolen a million rand, the asset forfeiture unit can freeze assets up to the value of 2 million rand, and it can also freeze assets of other persons. So if the criminal has given the money away to one of his co-conspirators, uh, that money can be recovered from the co-conspirators directly. OK. Um, but also, um, sorry, you were asking? No, carry on, sir. Um, so that's quite a powerful power because it, uh, it includes money that may be hidden in trust accounts and things like that. So in a sense, the powers that the asset forfeiture unit has is in most cases more effective than the powers that the, the special investigating unit has. But in, 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 they do complement each other's powers quite well. And I sort of speak from a background of being in head right. of both of those units. Right, so I have right. quite a lot of experience in that area. Indeed. Now, Mr. Hoffmeyer, under which circumstances is the preservation order granted and the confiscation of criminal assets happened before the investigation is completed? 
Yeah, basically that is, um, for, for, if we're talking about the asset forfeiture unit, it can basically go to court essentially mainly when the person has been charged. So there's evidence that the person has the done, done the wrong thing. And it can then freeze the assets. It can go to court and a judge issues an order that freezes the assets of that person. But not only their direct assets, uh, we know many criminals these days are poor because the money goes into a family trust account or other ways of hiding the money. So essentially it can freeze all those monies and appoint an independent curator to look after the money until the court case is done. So the curator will take possession of the cars, the houses, all of those sort of things and keep them safe while the litigation is ongoing. It's only when somebody is finally convicted that the money is then recovered. But the asset forfeit unit, if I can say briefly, also has another power that is, is in a sense, more powerful, and that is the non-conviction-based asset forfeiture. So in that case, you have to show that the, the assets themselves are proceeds of crime. You know, so for example, in the Digital Vibes case or another case, if you can find the money in a bank account somewhere, that money is very directly and clearly the proceeds of a crime. And in that case, there is the what's called a non-conviction-based asset forfeiture, where you can show that money is the exact same money that was stolen, and it can be recovered through a much faster process than waiting for a conviction that that will take often many years. And in respect to the non-conviction of, um, I mean, non-conviction asset for feature, what happens then should enormous amounts of money already paid to companies and individuals implicated are not recovered? Well, I, I think essentially, in most cases, most of the money can be recovered. Um, but for that, you do need real experts in finance and in tracking and tracing the assets. Okay. Because obviously people do try and hide their assets somewhere where it's difficult to find. And I think one of our big challenges as in the past has been trusts. You know, you can create a family trust. There's no record anywhere in the state who has trusts or not, because unfortunately the master's office where those records are kept are not in electronic format. So you have to go and find actual brown folders. Um, so it's not always an easy way. Uh, it's not always easy to track the, the assets and find them, but there are some very good people in law enforcement who's had now 20 years of experience of, of trying to track assets. So I think the state's capacity is quite good to do that. Okay. Now, in the past month, Mr. Hofmeyer, the Special Investigations Unit has been busy and had its hands full uh, with regards to investigations linked to, uh, you know, first and foremost, the COVID-19 government contracts from the Houting Health Department's Personal Protective Equipment contract, the Houting Education Sanitizing contracts to the National Health's uh, irregular contract with Digital Vibes and so many others. I mean, the list goes on. Has corruption become so endemic and, uh, you know, accepted crime linked to some of our public officials? I think it is unfortunately true to say that. And, you know, I think what state capture means, and as we see from the Zondo Commission, is that there are many people in the state and unfortunately in the ruling party who have systematically tried to steal and loot money from the state. So... I think we're probably at the point at the moment where corruption in the past few years have been worse than at any other time in the history since democracy. Okay. And it has had a negative impact on the government's ability to deliver basic services like water, roads, electricity, housing and sanitation. So are the recovered funds enough to mend the financial losses incurred and suffered by government? In most cases, um, provided that there has been a decent investigation, which is sometimes a challenge, but in most cases, most of the money can be recovered. It's seldom that you can recover all of it, 
But, you know, some criminals also do put their stolen money into accounts where they can earn interest and so on. So sometimes you can recover a bit more than they actually stole. OK. And are there any constitutional ramifications, perhaps, on how the processes are accomplished by law enforcement agencies? In the early days of asset forfeiture, we faced a lot of legal challenges because the law was new and it was seen to be a very drastic law, and it is a pretty drastic law, I mm, must say. Mm, mm. But all those issues have been litigated up to the Constitutional Court. And, you know, for the past, by about 2012, 13, most of the legal issues around the use of asset forfeiture had been uh, pronounced upon by the Constitutional Court. So there's not that many legal challenges that can be brought anymore now. Okay. The law is pretty settled and clear. And what's the role of public interest then in the prosecution of the complex cases being investigated by uh, the law enforcers such as the SIU? Does public interest and uh, public pressure play a role in the prosecution of those cases? I think it has played a big role, particularly during the period of state capture, um, when we often had bad people in charge of law enforcement. I'm not mm. going to name names, but I'm sure you know who I mean. Um, you know, so in, in those cases, I think public pressure in some cases actually forced uh, law enforcement to to take action, even though the bosses of law enforcement at that time were not very keen to take action. OK, Mr Hoffmeyer, great chatting to you. Thank you so much for your thoughts and for your reflections on this matter. It's a pleasure, and thanks for having me. All right, that was uh, Vilja Hoffmeyer, the former head of Special Investigating Unit and the Asset for Feature Unit at the National Prosecuting Authority, talking to us more about the significance of law enforcement agencies freezing assets linked to alleged criminal activities.